What is generative AI and why is it causing so many problems? There are three primary issues that we found with using generative AI, like chat GPT, for example. The first is that it keeps making things up. It gives us the wrong links. And yes, it can provide links to things like research papers. And it keeps getting facts wrong. And the question is, why? And when you start to understand what generative AI, like ChatGPT, is doing, you can start to understand why it's doing what it's doing. And particularly if you're using fact-based stuff for research and other things, why you really need to check what it's saying. But I'll explain all of that as we go along. So let's just have a look at the first problem. The first problem is it's making things up. So let me just give you an example of this. So I asked ChatGPT to give the main takeaways for the book, The Ambiguity Advantage. Now, the reason that I've used this book is that I wrote it, so I know exactly what's in it. And it's just very easy for me to check whether it's making things up or not. So let's just have a look at what it came up with when I asked that question. It gives all this scree. It says, The Ambiguity Advantage by David Wilkinson, that's me, is a book that explores the benefits of embracing ambiguity in decision-making, problem-solving and leadership. And it gives a whole load of takeaways. And actually, that is not a bad pricey of the whole book. There's one or two things that are creeping in here that um, aren't in the book. So, for example, it's talking about mindset. Now, this book was published in 2006, which is some time ago, and that was before Carol Dweck released her research on mindset. So it wasn't a word that was being used, and it's certainly not a word that's within the book. So it's added some stuff here. But the rest of it, not a bad pricey, um, wherever it's got it from. And again, it's talking down here. It says, by cultivating a growth mindset, which is one of Carol Dweck's uh, concepts, I don't talk about that. Um, it wasn't a thing in 2006. It's clearly adding stuff in here as well. Then I said, what's the reference for this? And it, rather than giving me the full reference, what it's done is it's given as this. It says, the information I provided in my previous response about the main takeaways from the book is based on my knowledge as an AI language model trained by OpenAI. But it doesn't actually give the reference. So if you're looking for a specific reference for any of the points, please let me know and I'll do my best to provide it. So I ask again, give me the reference in APA format, which is the one of the formats that I use for referencing. And sure, it says here, The Ambiguity Advantage by David Wilkinson. Everything else is correct, but the date's wrong. It's not 2019, it's 2006. So it's got a, a an issue with the date. But, you know, hey, it's close. So I then said, who am I? Who's David Wilkinson, the book's author? And this is where things start to get interesting. Um, David Wilkinson is a British psychologist, true, author and speaker, has extensive experience in academia and business. Yeah, that's true. Um, he's the author of several books on leadership, okay, um, including The Ambiguity Advantage, What Great Leaders 2019, wrong date again. And then it talks about the leadership shadow, um, that uh, they're not my books. I've never written those books. I don't even know what they are. It says I'm a fellow of the British Psychological Society and a visiting professor at the University of Westminster. I think I've only been to the University of Westminster once, and that was for a conference many, many years ago. I am not a visiting professor at the University of Westminster, um, and I don't teach on the MBA programme. And then the rest of this looks like it's been lifted from one of my sites, which is about having worked with a range of organisations as a leadership consultant, things like that. So I asked again, who's the author of The Ambiguity Advantage, which is the same question, but in a different way, in a different format. And let's see what it comes up with. Now it says The Ambiguity Advantage has multiple authors. The book is written by David Wilkinson. And now I'm a professor at the University of California, which I'm not, Santa Barbara. And it's talking about two other people that are meant to be co-authors of the book. And they're not, most definitely not. I wrote it on my own. And now it's saying the book was published in 2010 rather than 2019 by MIT Press. Both of those things are wrong. All of this is wrong as well. They've got one of the, the authors correct, but there is only one author for this book. So it's adding stuff and it's getting stuff wrong. Let's have a look at the second problem. And this is about inaccurate linking. 
So one of the things you can do when you're asking for references for things, because you can ask for references, is you can ask for the reference and you can ask for the link to the reference, which is known as a DOI link. So a DOI link is a digital objects identifier. So it's a unique link for a particular piece of research or a particular research paper. Um, and I say it's unique. Um, there's only one series of numbers that uh, go with that particular book or paper and that you should be able to follow the link and find exactly that paper. It'll take you to the journal and to the paper itself. So I asked it a question here and, and this is something that I was doing with um, some of my students. Uh, can you have too much cognitive flexibility? And I was getting them to have a look at the question and to see how accurate GPT was. So it came up with this answer. We then said, give me the references for this. And it came up with all of these references. And this is the DOI link here. That's the link. And I clicked on the link and it went to the right paper, which is pretty impressive. And I started to get really excited. I thought, actually, you know, ChatGPT is really coming of age and is really useful. We then went to the second link, which is a paper here about Johnson, Ruggiero and Carver about cognitive behavioral and effective responses to reward. So I clicked on that link. And this happened, wasn't found. So let's click on this second link and see what it takes us. So it should take us to a paper called Cognitive Behavioral and Effective Responses to Reward and so on. No, it doesn't. Um, the link's not found and the DOI doesn't exist. So we can't just go straight to it. So I tried all the rest and all the rest came up with exactly the same thing. Those links don't work. Uh, and then I tried this one, the Martell and Nig paper, which is child ADHD and personality temperament traits of reactive and effortful control, resiliency and emotionality. Um, when I did that, what it came up with was a completely different paper. That is not that paper and it's not by those people. So it's confusing um, the DOI links completely. So we've got an issue with it, it's generating links that don't exist uh, and, and DOI um, identifiers that don't exist and it's confusing them and providing the wrong paper at the same time so when I went then and it, so if you remember let me just go back what this um, is called the child HDHT paper I then went into um, Google Scholar put it in and it found it so it is a proper paper it's just got the link wrong and now let's just have a look at problem three about getting facts wrong this um, copy here actually came from one of my students essays and so apart from the fact that they were citing Harvard Business Review which they get the knuckles wrapped for because it's not a peer-reviewed paper it's not peer-reviewed and the vast majority of the, um, the the stuff within the Harvard Business Review is opinion pieces and editorials it is not research so I had a chat with a student and the student admitted that they'd generated this piece through ChatGPT uh, and the reason I got tipped off was this second bit here. It says, similarly, a 2017 study published in the Journal of Leadership Education, which is a real journal, found that many leadership development programs do not adequately incorporate research-based best practices. The study suggests that blah, 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 right? Now, I know this area of research pretty well, and I wasn't aware of this study. So I got quite excited that they'd found a study that I didn't know. I went into ChatGPT and I did this with the student beside me and we did a little bit of checking. We went through, generated exactly the same thing that you saw on the last screen. And then we asked, what is the 2017 study you reference? And it came up here. The 2017 study I reference is titled Leadership Development Programs and Evidence-Based Review. Now that sounds really exciting. And I don't know that paper, which I got really excited about because, as I say, I know this area. And I was thinking, there's a significantly large study here. You know, this study is analysing 335 articles. Really? That's big. Why don't I know about this? And it provides an awful lot of detail about the paper. It's talking about the main um, uh, aspects of the paper. As I say, it gives all of this information about the um, the authors, where where they came from, the New University of North Cal Carolina and the University of Central Florida. And it sounds very plausible. You hear this and you think, this is based on fact. This is good stuff. 
And then I said, okay, list the best practices, and it does it. And again, all of this is very plausible. It sounds right. It sounds, it's using the kind of language you would get in a, in a journal article. So I'm really intrigued now, and I'm saying, okay, so give me the reference, and it gives me this reference. Klein, Naumann, and Wallner. Leadership Development Programs and Evidence-Based Review in the Journal of Leadership Education. So let's go, and it gives a DOI. So we do the thing that we were talking about in the last problem, click on the link or go to the DOI Foundation and see whether it can resolve the DOI um, identifier and not found, doesn't exist. So the next thing to do is go to Google Scholar and see if that can find it. So I put in here the title of the paper and usually what happens is if it finds the paper, you've just got the one paper up here, but nothing. That's odd, why doesn't Scholar find the paper? So I now try, and this is a, a useful trick, you put in the authors, because usually that's pretty unique identifier for a paper, particularly if there's more than one author um, and with their initials. You can usually find exactly the right paper you want just by copying and pasting in the, the authors. But again, nothing. There isn't even that particular combination of authors within Scholar. So the next thing I do is go along to the Journal of Leadership Education, go to the volume number, which was 16 from 2017. It doesn't exist. And I actually search for the whole paper in that journal. There's no such paper. So it's making things up. So what's going on? Why are we getting these three problems with ChatGPT and generative AI? And it comes down to the nature of generative AI. And there's a clue in the name, really, generative. So what is it that generative AI is actually doing? Well, there's a couple of things. Firstly, it's making predictions based on statistics and probability, based on maths. What it's churning out is based on training and data and the way that it's trained in a framework program. And what it's doing is it's looking for patterns and associations to predict word co-occurrences, like which words go together, and syntactic relationships. How do I create sentences that are understandable? But it's based on mathematical probability rather than a deep sense of meaning and understanding that this makes sense and has meaning. It is, in effect, just a set of mathematical probabilities. And that matters. And then it's literally generating a probability of what might come next within a sentence statistically. It's very clever in as much as it's creating those probabilities, but it's generating sentences as it goes along. And it's working out what it thinks might come next. So let me give you an example of this. So let me ask you this question. What does that formula mean to you? Now, for most people, not a lot, unless you happen to be in astronomy. It's actually a thing called the Drake Equation, and what it's about is about calculating the probability of uh, other intelligent life in our universe. But even then, even knowing all of that, that formula itself probably doesn't mean an awful lot. It's starting to mean more now that I've not so much given you the name because the, the label doesn't mean anything. Knowing what it's for starts to help and starts to help to create some form of meaning. But if I do this and I show you the formula and the bits of the formula, and we say, okay, N, that means is the number of detectable civilizations within the Milky Way galaxy. So we now know that this is bounded within the galaxy. R is the rate at which stars are born. FP is the fraction of stars that are going to be hosting planets that have planets going around them. NE is the number of habitable planets per planetary system and the probability of that. Fi is the, the fraction of those planets on which life is likely to occur. Then there's a fraction of life that evolves intelligence. So it's more than just some amoeba, that there's some level of intelligence. And then we look at the fraction of intelligent life that develops communicative technology so that it can communicate because otherwise we're not going to know about it if it's still within its system and there's no technological communication that chances of us ever finding life um, without that is is very remote and then the average length of 
time civilization is detectable. So the likelihood that um, humankind is going to last for a very, very long time, like millions of years, is pretty slim. Now what's happening is, now we start to understand the bits, it's starting to have a little bit more meaning. So we generate, we create knowledge through a, a revealing of meaning as we start to understand things. That's very different to what AI is doing. And the answer, by the way, if you want, is a one in 10 billion trillion chance that there's intelligent life within the Milky Way, which isn't very good. Now, however, when you consider that Milky Way is just one of billions of galaxies, the chances of intelligent life start to increase quite a lot. But they're so far away that our ability to be able to detect that gets less and less and less the further they are away. But anyway, we're not here for that. So... I just want to show you graphically what AI is doing and you, you'll be able to see what it's doing here. So what we've got here is a photograph from Oxford. This is my um, my reading room is in this building. It's called the Radcliffe Camera. So what I did was I set a generative AI to create a picture of the Radcliffe Camera. It's a very famous building. So on the left, what we're going to do is a series of slides and I keep repeating the same question. Give me a picture of the Radcliffe camera. So here's the close-up picture of the Radcliffe camera. And the first time I did it, it produces this. Now, the point here is it looks similar, but it's not the same. It's not exactly factual. So there are no pillars down here, like it's got pillars down here. It's not bad, but it's not right. It's generated a probability of what the Radcliffe camera must look like from the data it has. So let's have another look when I asked it another one. This is almost photographic and looks again similar and now it's got no pillars down here but what it's done is it's taken these porthole type windows at the top in the cupola up here and it's put them down here. And you can start to get this understanding of how it's generating things through probability it's not repeating things it's not a database that's just finding the facts and repeating it and a lot of people are making that mistake assuming that what's coming out of it is factual here's another one same question generate or give me a picture of the Radcliffe camera yeah, it's not bad but it's not right and another one again not bad but it's not quite right. And again, and in fact, it's got a really wide bit down here. And architecturally, that's very interesting. It's even got Merton College down here. And that college does exist and it's there. This is probably one of the closest. But it's not quite right. Look, it's got three pillars here when actually it's two, two, two all the way around. There's no pillars down here, and that's fine. And that, so that's not bad, but you can see what it's doing. It's generating a response. It's kind of there, but not quite. And this one's interesting because this is the inside of the upper reading room, which is up here, and my reading room is in the upper reading room. Now, it doesn't have a glass roof. Where it's got that from, I don't know. It's generated that. Now, this bit down at the bottom here of the generated picture isn't far off. It does look a little bit like that, and the colours are about those kinds of colours when you're in there. And this is what the upper Radcliffe camera actually looks like. So it's not far off, and at night, the colours are the same. Again, so you can start to see what it's doing here. It's even got the Bodleian Library in the background, as you can just start to see that here, and that's almost the same view, but again, close but it's not factual. And this is what generative AI is doing. It's generating ideas, sentences, and things, and it's generating papers based on a probability of what is likely to come next. Now, that's quite interesting from a research point of view. That 2017 study, let me just go back to that. Actually, that might be not a bad study to do. And it's what it's done is we've asked it, you know, what is the reference? And it's generated a reference, but it doesn't exist. And it's generated a study, 
but it doesn't exist. And it's taken bits from other places, and there's clearly there must be a study somewhere that's analysed 335 paper, which is an awful lot, by the way, to analyse, unless you're using kind of machine learning. But it's just like these things here. It's just generating what it thinks is likely to come next. It's not picking up what's real. And that's why you need, once you understand what it's doing and what you can use it for and what its limitations are, it becomes a very powerful tool. But what I'm seeing at the moment, and certainly, and, and this is why I run these sessions with my students, is that it, it's not producing factual information. It's generating a probability of what's likely to come next. You understand that? you can use it properly. If you don't understand that, you're going to get fooled by it. I hope this was useful. If you would like free research briefings and more around organisations and people, things like leadership, management, organisational development, work psychology and so on, head over to oxford-review.com and sign up and I'll send you a whole load for free. Thank you.